For several years, I've been the co-organiser of an annual lunch for retired BBC engineers. And a major feature of these London lunches has always been a presentation by a key figure in our industry. Traditionally, this has been someone with a BBC connection, but a couple of years ago, we decided to go for a view from the other side, someone with an ITV background. A wise owl in the RTS suggested Norman Green, which turned out to be an excellent idea. Not only does Norman have a background steeped in independent television, and indeed the whole of our industry, but his roots and stories go back to the beginning of our high definition system. And by high definition, I do of course mean 405 lines. So sit back and enjoy. We're in for a treat. I have given quite a few lectures and talks in my time, but never one quite like this, so I wasn't really sure where to start or what to say. So I thought you may like to know how I got into the fun factory industry that is television. My backstory, as they say nowadays. We all have interesting career histories, and mine may fill in some gaps for you, and you can say, ha ha, that's why such a thing happened. Don't get worried, I'm not going to give you my life story, but some highlights of my career that may also have had an indirect effect on yours at the BBC. Because sure as night follows day, the BBC had an impact on my work in life. My father was one of the 110 people at EMI Research Laboratories at Hayes in Middlesex, who between 1931 and 1936 invented the electronic television system that we know today. He then went on to work on the design of every TV camera EMI made right up to the famous 2001. In his final year before retirement, he was working on the mechanical design of the experimental prototype of the world-famous Godfrey Hounsfield invention of computerized tomography, which gave us brain and body scanners which have revolutionized medical diagnosis over the last 50 years. When I was young, starting in 1948, he took me to the radio shows at Olympia, and we always visit the HMV and Marconi phone stands to see his friends and for me to have a close-up look at things like the wonderful model of the first OB unit from 1937. Despite occasional experience to the contrary, we human beings persist in regarding New Year as a subject for rejoicing. At the Royal Albert Hall, London, as movie tone audiences jinx every New Year's Eve. We had our first TV set on the last day of 1948 and watched the New Year's Eve Chelsea Arts Ball from the Royal Albert Hall. The set was designed by HMV to be a people's set, but it was not very easy to adjust, so they decided to sell the hundred pre-production sets that they had made to the research staff for a hundred guineas each, which was a great deal of money in those days. In fact, roughly a sixth of my father's yearly salary. Two famous people used to come to our house and repair the set when it went wrong. They were Pat Leggett and Phil Parker. Pat Leggett would end up as head of Telecine and VTR at the BBC TV Centre and then head of engineering information. He used to wear baggy old brown corduroy trousers and come on a clapped out old XWD motorbike that made a terrible noise as it left Bromfontein Avenue. Phil Parker became the first director of engineering at RTE 
and then became director of engineering of Yorkshire Television, where he designed and built the Studios Centre in Leeds. My father was very ill in 1951 in hospital, so Phil Parker took my sister and I to the Festival of Britain, and here I was allowed to operate the new six-lens CPS Emmatron camera. It was all very exciting to a 12-year-old. During the early 1950s, I used to go to EMI research laboratories during my school summer holidays, and I saw sequential colour television, the famous flying spot telecines, the microwave links, and the Kirker shots and Wenvo transmitters being made. I also saw camera tubes being made, and the huge six to eight feet high klystrons for naval and RAF radars. They were all designed and made in the laboratories. When I went to my research laboratories as a research student, I was told I could not go into television research as all the research had been done. So it was military work, line scan and blue joker for me. Line scan was a war office study contract to effectively scan the ground under an aircraft from horizon to horizon with a one-line scan and then microwave it back to a receiving point where the signal was recorded on 35mm film that moved past the one-line display to produce a photographic record of the land that the aircraft had flown over. We used a decoder plane for these trials that was provided by Ferry Aviation and it was based at White Waltham Aerodrome in Berkshire. The study contract was later turned into a production contract to produce a system that was displayed on a TV monitor via a frame store in an aircraft. It was for the TSR-2 and when it, that was cancelled, it was put into a reconnaissance pod for the Phantom and Jaguar aircraft. I will not go into it, it now, but Blue Joker was an interesting project. It involved the largest barrage-type balloons built in this country since the airships of R-100 and R-101 fame, and involved lifting a radar scanner to about 5,000 feet to look down on Russian aircraft flying at zero feet above the sea. The flight trials of the balloons were done at Cardington, the RAF base near Bedford, and the radar tr system trials in North Wales overlooking Cardigan Bay. We had Canberra jet bombers flying at zero feet above the sea, and we were trying to find them in the noise signal caused by the waves on the sea, which is called clutter. When these projects were completed, I went into Dr. E. L. C. White's advanced study and research group. White was the brilliant circuit designer who worked with the genius Bloomline on the invention of electronic television. I worked on a daily basis under White's guidance for two years, working on a universal logic element called Unilog. And here is one of them. Then. I finally did manage to work on the design of two TV cameras for the Black Knight rocket that were to monitor its stabilised platform. After five years, I joined the central research labs of the Rank organisation. There I worked on the logic design of the Zeronic computer printer. It was the fastest computer printer in the world and it printed on paper 28 inches wide going through the machine at 40 feet a minute, and it printed 7,600 alphanumeric characters a second. After that, I worked on the problems of drawing non-coherent and coherent fibre optics and miniature lasers and holography. Remember, this was the early 1960s. However, after five years, I realised that I would never be able to get married and buy a house on the salary ranks were paying me. So I applied for and obtained a post at ABC TV in the Engineering Research Department at Teddington Studios. 
And whilst I was working out my three month salary, my future salary went up by £160 due to a union negotiated in increase. This was absolute heaven. At ABC TV, Howard Still, the chief engineer, was lit just leaving to become the director of engineering at the ITA, so I would be under Dr. Boris Townsend. Howard Steele had designed the ABC control rooms, which were in a semicircular configuration with glass windows between the sound, production, vision and lighting control rooms to allow staff to be in direct visual contact with one another. The new 405-525-625 line studio centre at Teddington also had ABC design transistorized vision mixers, switching matrices, distribution amplifiers, etc., which were very advanced for that time. Howard then made the radical change to OB units. Up until then, in OB units, the engineering and production staff all sat behind one another at different levels, all looking at the same picture monitors laterally across the vehicle. Howard took his studio concept and turned it into an OB unit, where the crews sat longitudinally down the vehicle in three separate control rooms, sound, production and vision engineering all separated by glass windows and doors for visual contact. Two units were produced for the 1966 World Cup and one was based at Castle Bromwich Football Ground in Birmingham. As you probably know, there were a great many stadiums to be covered for the World Cup and BBC and ITV OB units shared this task. When the draw took place as to who covered which match, the first match in Birmingham was the BBC match. So the first match the unit covered was not for ABC, but for the BBC, with a BBC crew and an ABC guarantee engineer. David Coleman was the match commentator. At ABC TV, Mike Cox was investigating and demonstrating all the colour TV systems such as CCAM, NIR and later POWER but not NTSC, as the BBC appeared to be wedded to anglicised NTSC. In October 1966, ABC Television gave a colour demonstration for the ITA in Knightsbridge, originated from Studio 3 at Teddington. It was given to the Postmaster General, the Right Honourable Edward Short. Research had been done on his interests, so they were included in the programme. The demonstration was a great success and in February 1967 he announced that colour would start on November the 15th 1969 on BBC One and ITV transmitted on UHF channels. I was working on the problems of colour film for television, in particular the Avenger series. This work involved designing a telecine Cine simulator, and it was this project that caused my first visit to the BBC Research Department at Kings of Warren to meet C.B. Wood, Richard Sanders and Tony Tariff Griffiths, who were in the image scanning section. ITV, unlike ITA IBA, always got on very well with BBC Engineering, because they never saw us as a threat. We were just people trying to push forward television techniques. In 1967, 
ABC TV sent me to North America for three weeks to study automation techniques in television at CBS and CBC. Then, in 1968, I designed, built and helped program the first computer-controlled presentation and master control switching system in Europe built around a digital equipment PDP-8i computer which cost at today's money £122,000. It was installed at the new Thames Colour Studio Centre at the top of Tottenham Court Road. The Union's Blackness system but we later found out that they were using it for schools programming, which was transmitted in the mornings as only one member of the master control staff had to work, be at work to oversee the computer system and the transmission of the school's programs. After seven years at ABC Thames in late 1972, I went to the IBA as Principal Engineer in the Quality Control and Code of Practice Group. By the end of the first day, I knew I had made a mistake. This was not television, this was the civil service, and as I was neither civil nor a servant, I decided that I must leave as soon as possible, so I made sure that nobody could say I could not do the job, and meanwhile looked for another post. In April 1973, I became the Independent Television Companies Association first, and as it turned out, last, coordinating engineer. Then, in 1990, I became head of technology for the ITV network. I think I should explain here the difference between the IBA and the program companies. The IBA was the regulator appointed by the government to oversee independent broadcasting, both radio and television. The IBA advertised franchises to provide television in various regions of the country and invited tenders. Possible future programme contractors would put together a prospective prospectus of what programmes they would like to produce where they would build their studios, the equipment they would use, and their financial plans. They also got the great and the good of the area to be part of the application. When a company was awarded a franchise, it undertook to produce certain quotas of programmes in all the different genres, like drama, light entertainment, current affairs, children's and religion. The companies also had to agree to the financing of ITN to produce the news. In addition, the companies paid the IBA a monthly rental for permission to broadcast. The IBA even used to scrutinise the scripts of some programmes in advance and, if necessary, ask for changes to be made. It was a strange system but allowed some wonderful programmes to be made and a balanced schedule to be presented to the public. My first job at ITCA was to help form seven technical working groups. These were on audio techniques, VTR, video including the code of practice, digital techniques, network procedures and standards, film and telecine, and fundamentals. Each consisted of a chairman, who was a chief engineer, four members from the companies, plus the member of the appropriate EBU group. These groups would monitor their respective fields of work and decide if anything had to be done collectively for the ITV companies. In 1973, the IBA and the BBC demonstrated teletext, and in 1974 the IBA said they wanted ITCA to run a teletext editorial system, and they would build it for us for £250,000. I was shown the proposal, and I remembered the VT30 graphics engine that Digital Equipment had designed for the ITN election coverage of 1973 
that would make a super coloured visual display unit for the editorial staff. So I went off to the DEX Special Systems Group and we wrote a specification that included an editorial unit at LWT doing general items of interest and the weather and another one at ITN inputting the latest news and the news flash. These two units were connected by data links and both computers were connected to another computer at Thames Television in order for it to insert the data signal onto the video leaving Thames. The total cost would be £210,000 and the programme companies accepted this as it would save £40,000. Quite a lot of money in 1974. In fact, £420,000 at today's prices. The engineering division of IBA were not amused as we had coloured VDUs and they only had specified monochrome displays like those used by the BBC. In order to carry out this task, four engineers were seconded to me on a part-time basis by Thames, LWT, ITN and Anglia Television. Seven months later, the fully computerized system went on air. We then went on to invent graphics hold to give better maps, etc., as you could now change from one color to another without a black space between them. And we also invented double height characters, mainly for subtitling, as we had found that deaf people often have sight problems to cope with as well. What was nice was that some time months later, after the launch of the Teletext system, the then chairman of the ITCA Council, Sir John Freeman, of the famous programme Face to Face, put his head around my office door, congratulated me on the project and said that as a thank you, ITV were going to send me to the National Association of Broadcasters Convention in Chicago the following month, which was quite an experience for me and the start of 22 years of visits. Later that year, I was given a budget of 50k per annum, 365,000 at today's prices, to sponsor development projects at various organisations, projects such as video a to D's and D to A's, a digital component frame source synchronizer, a composite video digital mixer, which incidentally was designed by John Wood at ITN, who went on to design the Aston range of character generators, Brian Peathers that built the vision mixer at Cox Electronics. Now Brian had invented the NIR color system long before the Russians said they invented it, but the BBC hierarchy ignored it because, in my opinion, he worked in video maintenance at the television centre. By 1979 my workload had built up and George Johnson from the BBC joined me as my assistant. The programme companies then came under great pressure from the IBA. They wanted to take over studio research and development that could have resulted in them specifying and even designing program companies' studio centres. Studio R&D was much more glamorous to the IBA than transmitters and aerial masts. This, of course, could not be allowed to happen. So after a big day-long consultation in front of Lady Plowden, the then chairman of the IBA, in which the ITCA were clear winners, the chairman of the ITCA council decided to offer the IBA an olive branch. That was that ITCA would set up five laboratories, three large and two small, located at programme companies, studio centres, this was so that engineers could meet producers, directors and other staff of the company and find out what their technical problems were and what equipment they needed. This was the strength of placing the labs at the studios. In fact, 
Only two large and one small laboratory were built due to a cyclical downturn in advertising revenue at the wrong moment. They were at Thames, Granada and Scottish Television. In the early 1980s, the ITCA Cable and Satellite Working Party was formed under Brian Tesla, the man who gave the program concept and financial go-ahead for the world-famous Thames program, The World at War. It soon became apparent that Mrs Thatcher wanted the UK to have a direct broadcasting satellite, and she appointed the chairman of the p and shipping line to achieve it. So one day, Brian Tesla, David McCall, MD of Anglia Television, and generally known as Mr Money to the ITV MDs, and I were in a long narrow room in a house in Carlton House Terrace, along with representatives of the BBC, including Bill Cotton and Bill Dene, the Home Office, the Post Office, and BAE Systems. Then in walked this tall man wearing a suit with a waistcoat. He stood at the end of the table, took his hunter watch out of the waistcoat pocket, swung it around on its chain, then held open the waistcoat pocket and swung the watch into it. He then said, Now, gentlemen, we must go on a war footing. Bite the bullet and get this satellite launched. Well, Brian and David looked at each other and then at me with absolutely incredulous looks. After the meeting, we went to LWT and discussed what had happened and decided ITV did not wish to be part of the project. Next day, I was in my office and the phone went in my secretary's office and she said to me, rather amazed, that Bill Cotton was on the phone. Bill wanted to know off the record what ITV's opinion was. I told him unofficially that we wanted nothing to do with it and he told me the BBC had the same view. In 1982, there was a demonstration by NHK of the Japanese USA 112560 high definition television system to the EBU's executive council and representatives from the engineering departments of all the EBU members at Kilkenny in Ireland. The Japanese and the USA wanted it to become a world standard. Subsequently, it was decided that ITV would start investigating high-definition television at the Granada Laboratory. We first of all decided to investigate the effect of using a 60 hertz system with 50 hertz lighting, because at that time, Drama production was used in large warehouses in which large sets of all the offices, say, of a police station or the ward and its ancillary rooms of a hospital were built, and these were lit by fluorescent tubes in false ceilings. A set of 60 hertz camera and recording equipment was used to video the scenes alongside the 50 hertz video equipment. It was also used to video football matches and other floodlit events. As you would expect, there was flicker on the video recordings, and these were sent to NHK, who said they could remove it with a flicker licker, as they called it. Well, it changed the nature of the flicker, but did not erase it. Then, in 1985, ITCA joined the Eureka 95 European High Definition TV project. We searched for someone to build us a 1250 line camera complete with aperture correctors and against NHK's wishes, Hitachi agreed to provide us with a camera, a 54 inch rear projection display using four inch tubes, a 19 inch monitor and a test generator, all for £400,000, which is £1.22 million at today's prices. We did three weeks of acceptance testing in Japan 
and then once the laboratory people at Granada had familiarised themselves with the kit, we cut it to the BBC at Kingswood Warren, Phillips Research at Redhill, and the IBA at Crawley Court to allow people to record sequences into their image processors. Early in 1987, EU95 decided to launch and demonstrate 1250 line HD Mac at IBC in September 1988. Mrs Thatcher, via Kenneth Baker, said she would meet 50% of the costs that the BBC, Quantel, Sintel and Snell and Wilcox incurred in producing equipment for the 1250 line project. ITCA received nothing. We lobbied Kenneth Baker, but he said that Mrs Thatcher had decreed that we were a commercial organisation and could not have any assistance. We wondered what type of organisations Quantel, Sintel and Snell and Wilcox were. Were they charities? This really annoyed the programme companies and they authorised 1.8 million 5.1 million at today's prices, with another 500,000 if it was required, to design and build an HD production vehicle that would include two cameras, three VTRs with an edit control system, a vision mixer, a telecine, a slide scanner, a caption scanner, 16 by 9 monitors and a sound section. Excluding the cameras and the VTRs, which cost £150,000 each, 425000 at today's prices, these were all 625-line equipments that were modified for 1250-line operation by the laboratories in Scottish and Granada television, as there was literally no 1250-line production equipment available. When the EU95 HD chain group, of which I was chairman, were planning the pavilion on the Brighton beach for the 1988 IBC demonstrations, we consulted the Brighton Council about how far the sea came up the beach in the worst storms. They gave us a certain mark and it was decided to build the, the pavilion 15 feet above that mark. Then. On the Sunday night before the Thursday opening of IBC, there was a terrible storm, and in the morning we found water was lapping at the back door of the pavilion, but luckily it came no further. The BBC HD vehicle was to play its programme sequences out into our van, where they were added to a demonstration sequence directed by an ITV director. The weather was terrible, and we had to have scaffolding and tarpaulins put up as our, the side of the, our vehicle, with all the doors in it, was facing the sea and the rain. One day, during the demonstrations, there was a knock on the production area door, and it was a Frenchman asking if he could come in and watch. I told him that if he stood in the corner and kept quiet, it would be all right. Well, he stayed for about an hour, and then he asked me if I would take the van to the Elysee Palace for a demonstration to President Mitterrand. I replied that if he paid all our expenses, but not our salaries, we would do it. He went off into the rain, and I thought nothing would come of the idea. Well, on the day after IBC closed, it was a lovely sunny day, and I drove, drove my Granada estate down onto the beach road to help the guys pack up all the kit. In the afternoon, I called my office on the car phone, and my secretary said it had been very quiet, but she had received a fax from the office of the President of France, inviting us to go to the Elysee Palace, and that they would pay all our expenses. So then there was a mad period when everything had to be planned. The BBCOB department kindly arranged all the transport to Paris, 
and whilst we were rigging in the Elysee Palace, the BBC band went off with the ITV programme director to record video scenes of Paris, including the Quai d'Orsay Museum and down on the banks of the Seine. This was all edited together to an orchestral version of I Love Paris. The demonstration was to take place in a lecture-type theatre, and there was a long corridor to it that the President would have to walk down. We thought that if we put a camera looking down the corridor as the President walked towards it, we could record him, and then, when he was seated, we could play it back to him to show that there was no trickery going on. Well, on the afternoon of the demonstration, a man in a morning suit who had a long chain around his neck with a sort of metal hanging from it, looking like very much like a sommelier, came up to us and said we could not video the president at all, as he never went on TV without makeup. For the demonstration, I sat at the back of the theatre with my radio talkback cueing the planes from the van. Well, at the end of the demonstration, which was to convince Mitron that HD Mac worked, as he had to agree to France launching an HD capable satellite, I saw the guy who had originally came into the van in Brighton talking to the President and pointing up at me. With that, the President walked up the stairs to me. The aide introduced me to him, who shook my hand thanked me for arranging the demonstration, and with that they departed. It was all quite an experience. Over the years, the Thames Lab had been carrying out a great many investigations into digital processing of the video signal and the sampling rates to be employed. As I have already mentioned, we had a project to build a vision mixer which used three or four FSC sampling of the composite signal and then used the component signal. When the REC 601 digital standard was finally agreed, we built a digital studio control room alongside Thames TV Studio One control rooms that overlooked the studio floor. It contained our digital vision mixer a digital special effects unit, a digital Aston character generator, and two prototype Sony digital video tape recorders. Here we produced the first ever completely digitally processed television program. It was a school's program that had effects that could only be done digitally. We then did various digital inserts for analog programs, and then we produced the award-winning L'Enfance du Priest for, Christ, for Channel 4, which again had sequences that would have been very difficult or impossible by analog processing. The control room won the RTS Technology Award, which was the first of four that we were awarded in seven years, which was not bad going for a group of only 18 people. In 1989, the Thatcher Broadcasting Bill proposed to do away with the IBA and sell the transmitters to the highest bidder. I was tasked by ITV managing directors with finding out how much it cost to maintain and run the IBA transmitter network as ITV were considering whether to buy and run it. This was quite difficult as the IBA refused to disclose any information. So I had to counsel retired EMI, Marconi, Pi and IBA staff on their opinions of the costs that I had researched and then work out what the com combined costs might be. But I had no way of really knowing what the overall costs would be. So I rang up my friend Bill Dene, who was the BBC's Director of Engineering, and arranged a meeting with him. I walked round from Mortimer Street to Bill's office in Henry Wood House, opposite Broadcasting House, and we discussed my problem, and I showed him my figures. He took a file out of his desk and consulted it. 
He then said my figures were very close to the BBC's figures, and with that he said he was going off to see someone for ten minutes, and he left the open file on his desk. He got up, winked at me, and walked out. I took that as an invitation to have a look at the figures. Ten minutes later, Bill returned to find a closed file on his desk, and we then continued to discuss the ramifications of the new broadcasting bill. That was real friendship. In 1992, the 1990 Thatcher Broadcasting Bill, which allowed the highest bidder to effectively buy a franchise, came into effect. Plus, the IBA as a regulator was done away with. This spelt the death knell of the regional laboratories, but all the employees were offered jobs in a central lab at LWT in London, but only the Thames lab personnel moved there. After I left at the end of 1995, the remaining people either left or retired and were not replaced. George Johnson and Mike Elgie both made it to retirement, and when Mike retired in 2016, he was probably the only person in ITV who really understood what happens technically from the scene that the camera is pointed at until it ends up on the display in the home. What I liked about working in television, and ITV in particular, was the friendship and kindness of nearly everyone I met. It was an absolutely wonderful time in my life. Thank you for listening to me, and many thanks to Phil Barnes for producing and editing this video. Just before we finish, here are a couple of demonstration videos that might be of interest to you. The first is the demonstration tape of the award-winning ITCA Digital Studio, which was installed at Thames Television in Teddington in 1986 and was the first all-digital studio control room in Europe. The second is the ITCA demonstration tape for the Eureka 95 1250 line HTTV demonstrations held at the IBC in Brighton in 1988. It was recorded in the Science and Industry Museum, which is next door to the Granada Studios in Manchester. I hope you enjoy them and they are of historical interest to you. Yeah.